So I'm delighted this afternoon to be talking to Sarah Raven. I think everybody must know of you, Sarah. Um, but just as a quick recap, you um, trained as a medic, as a doctor, and then you had two babies in fairly quick succession. And um, having babies and holding down a, a high, you know, high power job in a hospital is pretty near impossible, as many people agree, including my son. Um, but so then you you started into cut flowers. Now I first came upon you at Chelsea. I think I obviously had heard of you before, but in 1998, your garden on that corner plot was it for the Telegraph? It was, yeah, it was. It was fantastic because it was such a breath of fresh air because it was full of bright colours. You burst on the scene with this Chelsea garden on the corner plot. And it was it was quite revolutionary, wasn't it? Um, because of the bright colour, the use of flowers, the beautiful stone wall, which I think you bought from Scotland, I seem to remember. That's right. Well, you've got a very good memory. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I was doing one that year too. And you never looked hassled or whatever. And I was always sort of quite fraught and frantic. You know, things were never going according to plan. And you, I have to say, you seem to breeze through yours very, very well indeed. Um, well, not sure about. I really enjoyed it, but um, th there were terrible hassles though. Because do you see that stone, which is still here somewhere? But um, I came onto the <laughs> on site early one morning, soon after press, soon before I mean um, opening day or press day on the Sunday. Maybe it was on yes. the Saturday, and there was no water in the garden whatsoever, and there was there'd been a monumental leak, and the whole system <laughs> wasn't working, and. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I well, I may have looked rather like a duck or a swan, <laughs> green, but I can tell you there was <laughs> paddling. Um, also, Every, everybody has water problems, don't they, Chelsea? Yeah. They always seem to leak or flood. Or, it's, yeah. in there. it's inevitable, really. Sorry, you were going to say. No, the, the funny thing was that uh, um, you, you may be too polite to um, remind people, but actually I got a very low medal. And the reason that I did was because... Uh, the RHS judges at the time felt that my colour combinations were far too gaudy. And that's oh. why, that was the feedback. So it, you see, I was like, no, 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 you've got that all wrong. But they're like, no, I'm sorry, they're really ugly, your colour combinations. I mean, how can you put turquoise next to orange? And I was like, that was my favourite thing. Oh, <laughs> and, that's hilarious, isn't it? That yeah. really is hilarious. But I think, to, to, uh, in addition to that, I think you were a newcomer and they don't like women designers. I mean, one of the major sponsors said to me, we never use women because they always mark them down. And they were, if you remember, the, the judges were in, in almost invariably a load of men, weren't they? They might have had one token woman. Mm. And I'm not very sexist mm. and stuff, but mm. I mean, that really did gall a bit, that sort of thing, didn't it? Yeah. Um, no, and it did. It, it it was awful. I remember when we got the medal, we were all out to dinner on the Monday night, and I was completely devastated. I couldn't go near the site for two days, not because of me actually, but because people have worked so hard <laughs> on this. Anyway, we loved it. We absolutely loved it. <laughs> yeah, and and I think if you put it there this year, would you like to do that, Sarah? I think yeah. they would probably say, "My God, what wonderful use of colour! We love it. So revolutionary." <laughs> But anyway, um, so just before that, you brought out the cutting garden. There, there's a picture from the cutting garden, which now looks looks quite of its time, doesn't it? I'm sure it didn't yes. then, but yes. it's it's still yes. there, the cutting garden now, isn't it? But doesn't look quite like that. Doesn't look like that at all, no. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, I mean, I made that very, I mean, straight away, actually. So 1994, five, possibly. Yes. Uh, and I just, uh, I had tiny children at the time, so I needed to have a garden near the kitchen. So I laid that path with my own bare hands. Um, but anyway, so when they were asleep, I would nip out and do a bit of gardening because um, that was my kind of sanity, really. But yeah, so you can see it's all very ho um, homemade, like the woven hurdles, I made those and da da da. Um, no, no, it, it does look lovely. And, and, and um, it just compared to how it looks now, you've... Yeah. You've obviously progressed, haven't you? Your style and things. Yeah. Um, you're yeah. more individual than you were then, although that was yes. pretty individual of its time, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. No one was doing cutting gardens. I mean, the, the later one I prefer in the season because of the gondola posts, which were um, just literally copied from gondola posts in Venice, which kept the 
the hose off the beds on the corner. Um, oh, anyway, point them out to me when you see them in an another one. Okay. Now, now I put this photograph in because I just I had a quick chat with Jonathan Buckley via email uh, because I was trying to get the picture of the Chelsea Garden, and yeah. he said he, I just said you know give me a few anecdotes about working with Sarah, and he said. It was incredible because you did the wildflower book together, traveling all over the UK, and you'll be driving along at 40 miles an hour. And um, and then suddenly you'd spot some minute wildflower and say, stop, screech of brakes. <laughs> and, and you would actually recognize what it was from that distance. And um, and also, he said, you never give up. You know, he shot that you were shooting on the wettest day in Teasdale he's ever shot in. And there yeah. you are. You just were, con you know, really keen to get it all done that you wanted to get done. And then when you do have a tiny bit of downtime, when he was just footling around or something with his legs, <laughs> you grabbed a, a quick bit of shot eye. Yeah. Um, but um, you you are a worker, aren't you? Definitely a worker. Um, um, and and I think it, it's interesting that you had the medical training. Um, yeah. So you've got a very analytical mind and then you've obviously got an artistic bent. There's no two ways about that. And that is an unusual combination. Plus you work very hard. So all together, uh, would you say those are your main strengths that has really brought you to the fore uh, uh, now running a, quite a large company, having a lovely garden, lots of sort of talks and everybody wants to hear you, to read you, to follow your style. Or do you think I've missed out your some no, of your I think, No, I think that is true. I think I think what one must also be aware of is the work-life balance is not what a modern person would say was very um, good. It was, it's, uh, I don't have a work-life balance. Uh, you know, my my life is my work. So now I don't have children at home, that's fine. <clears throat> but when I had children, also family is incredibly important to me. So I guess that was, is and was a very important strand. So, but certainly in my work, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. I also, you know, I, lo I love home. I really hate, I don't like being away very much. Um, I'm a real kind of, um, and I just want to get home at the end of the day, even if I'm in Germany or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'd rather get home rather than stay in some. And I think, I don't know. Yeah, I definitely, I think that was the scarring of being on too many encore hospital rooms, which are pretty grim, as your son will know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And actually this <laughs> picture of me having crashed out, I mean, that's the other thing that medicine gave me. I can do a 20 minute nap and, and feel a bit, I'm afraid like Margaret Thatcher, that I'm completely, um, it's like a new day. And so I do do that 20 minute nap thing a lot. Yes, it's brilliant. I love it too. So talking about getting back to home, should we see the next picture up, which is of your home on the left? It's It wasn't the very before, was it? You've obviously got started on that. Yeah. And then the, a fairly recent one on the right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah. it, it does look stunning, doesn't it? Because it's a, a beautiful collection of buildings, beautiful landscaping. And the garden that fits nicely all around it is a very um, working garden, isn't it? it? It really it really does what you want. It's really a hard working yeah. garden that yeah. fits in. It's a bit like, you know, I always think like Mr. McGregor's garden on steroids, yes. you know, yes. but it's beautiful with it. Yeah, it is Mr. McGregor's patch, exactly how I think of it. But I mean, a, a lot of that, I mean, to be honest, the sort of materials and some of the design is down to Adam, my husband, who, um, who's who got a much better eye for design than me, I think, in many ways. So um, he, he, I mean, he's a very rectilinear bloke. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have got a few curvy paths in, which he thinks are rather sort of I don't know, not quite right, having been brought up at Sissinghurst. But um, yeah, and I think the thing that's good about the garden is that it's evolved totally around requirement. You know, it's not mm. been a thing where we've got a garden designer in because we wanted a lovely garden. We've added a new garden as and when I kind of needed the space. So, I mean, the, the gardens down the drive, I rather love in a way because that used to be grass. And then we ran out of space for a dahlia trial one year. So we just had to plow out the grass, you know, so it's it's as simple as that. And I yeah. like I like seeing the evolution of the garden around need. Mm. And I, I love the way you kept the grassy stripe up the track in the middle. Oh, yeah. um, 
yeah, that, yeah. that's what they have at Highgrove, isn't it? To the front for the front drive, the one that the late Greens used to yeah. use, and they have exactly the stripe coming up in the middle, which just keeps that lovely rural feel to it. Yeah, farm track, exactly. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So when you said uh, your husband's more rectilinear, so you do think automatically when you think of Adam Nicholson, you think of Vita and yourself, you think of Vita and Harold. His, yes. so they were his grandparents. And in that famous combination, Harold did all the layout, didn't he? Correct me if I'm wrong. Right. And Vita Absolutely. did all the other bits, the planting. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and are you a bit like that then? The two of you, would you say? Yeah, I mean, we really are in that in the we're we're building a, a new tiny sort of shed here, and all the gardeners um, know n not to come to me. I mean, so I I have to sort of sign it off, but they go and find Adam, so they'll say, okay, you know, have we got the have we got the pitch of the roof right, or are the gutter pipes right, or you know, and, and it's very very much the overall kind of aesthetics of the um the buildings particularly and the interiors quite a lot are very much his department and mine is 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 very much the outside i'm not oddly i am a details person in plants but i'm 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 quite impatient so i'm not a, a big details person on finish i'm quite yeah. messy so that that's quite good and do you ever disagree with the layout does does he ever say oh well I think you're wrong or whatever, uh, or do you just yes, leave yes. it to him? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's quite healthy, isn't it? When you have to thrash something through, I often think yeah. the result yeah. with someone, the result is often better. Really. Norm normally I would bow to him, but sometimes I feel really strongly and I'll just say, no, no, I just really don't agree. And then we'll talk about it for another month and then um, <laughs> we'll just, we'll just get their way. <laughs> That's kind of how it happens. There's the plan. Now that's a beautiful plan, isn't it? it shows exactly what's what. But what yeah. I couldn't see was I couldn't see the sun loungers, the barbecue, the fire pit. I thought I'm sure these ravens do relax, but where does it? <laughs> where does that all go on? It's true. Um, there is actually outside our kitchen, which is the left, the um, westernmost building apart from the stable. Um, we have got a big barbecue and we have got a pizza oven. Yeah, that one there. Ah, um, oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that 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 area is where it all happens, where you bring out the six course meals and things you've just dug up yeah. that hour. <laughs> and then also the greenhouse number twelve. Yes, is where we hang out as a family a lot actually. Um, in the in the evenings and the weekends, because obviously that's a semi public space in the weekdays because um yeah. we're either open or we or the staff are here but that becomes our sort of private space more in in the um in the weekends i have to say with that building that big new glass house i love yeah. the way you put your tomatoes and things all the way along the front of it so it sort of yeah. bends it in doesn't it quite nicely mm -hmm. um, to, to to the garden yeah. and is there anything there that we we might not have so we've got the barn garden number 11 um and yeah, then we've you've got um the rose, rose and rose garden. garden number 10 and then on number nine is the perennial cutting uh number nine no that's the trials that's the garden. trials garden yeah trials. so that was the original uh cutting garden the one that you showed first of all it was there because that's really near our kitchen right. so that was the first garden i made in literally the, the summer after we arrived so 1994 or five kind of thing and yeah. then i made and then i made number 17 which is the main cutting garden but that picture you showed, you know, didn't have any hedges or anything. So I had to put all those hedges in because um, it was it's very quite windy here. Yes. So, so everything, um, all those hedges are new. All the trees are new. Um, so what, yeah. when you mentioned your first cutting garden, um, what I thought was very indicative of your approach when you first did those squares. I'm already saying say you just did a meter square of several different cut flowers, yeah. and then you weighed or you counted the number of urns of each. Um, each plant that each plot produced so you were very analytical yeah. right from the word go which is I can't think of anyone who's ever done that I mean maybe they do commercially presumably when they're producing cut flower carnations or whatever yeah. but um, I've not known any private gardener as you were at that stage to do that and that is a very helpful approach isn't it well I think it's just how I think of uh, production whether it's food in the case of a year full of veg the new book or flowers um is is just like you've got to work out what you want and what I wanted at the time was maximum productivity from minimum space and minimum time and so then I worked out 
okay, so for that, how long is it from planting it to taking the first harvest and how long, how many weeks can I harvest from that meter squared? And so what does that add up to over the whole season? Uh, mm. And then how much does it cost to put it in? And then uh, does it have a good vase life? And we've done more trialing here probably about different experiments with what to do to plants than almost anyone in the UK. And so we've extended the vase life of some famously difficult things like dahlias quite a lot. Anyway, so it was all it was all that as well as how easy it was to grow. And so that yeah. gave you a mark out of 10. So basically, if I had little time and little space and little money, then I would only go for the nine out of tens mm. and ten out of tens um, that, that scored really high. Whereas, and it just, it was the first thing that made me realize peonies, much as they're lovely, are completely useless as a cut flower crop because they're so incredibly temporary. I mean, they're they're over, they're over before you've blinked. Yeah, yeah. But wait, wait, don't peony growers actually put them, submerse them in water or something? I remember having dinner with a peony grower and he yeah. submerse them in water or something and then they lasted a bit longer, but they are, they're beautiful. No, no, they're what I mean is, what I mean is from the moment that they come out of buds that you can harvest yeah. to the moment that they've dropped their petals and they're gone. Oh, is, I see. Her variety is actually three weeks. I mean, it's incredibly short. If you've got different varieties, you might extend it like rhubarb with to six weeks or asparagus. Yeah. But the actual harvest from a metre squared of peony, even if you've got six varieties, is just so little. So tiny. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I love them. So we were going to see the, the rose garden and the barn garden next, please. So these are beautiful photographs from your book, aren't they? They look really lovely. So when you are... Um, when you're planting your, your gardens, with obviously a lot of perennials and things like that, um, do you actually do a planting plan or how do you how do you work out what you're going to put there? Obviously, you've got a lot of players that are there, like the roses for some time. But or do you just think, well, I'll put a, a clump of so and so's there or I want to try out these new dahlias. So I'll try them next to this purple mm -hmm. sage. Or... Yeah, no, we don't. We don't do planting. We don't do planting plants. I mean. Uh, funny enough, the roses actually, that, that garden's quite new, in fact. That garden's only maybe six or seven years old. Um, this is the one with the little table in the corner. Yes. yes one exactly. on the right. Is it? Yes. yes. So I used to have all my propagating and cold frames there, and then I suddenly realised it was such a lovely sheltered spot. It was a bit crazy not to have a garden there. So I shifted all the cold frames and polytunnels away, and also we did up the barn. Um, so it then became kind of one of the most important bits of the garden. And actually, my great friend, Pip Morrison, who's a garden designer, I don't know if you know him, but he helped me uh, lay out that garden. Um, and then and then Josie, who's our head gardener here, was already here, absolutely loves roses. We'd never grown roses here because um, uh, we're organic. And so uh, and I, whenever I'd grown roses, I like the sort of Vita style ones. I just got black spot and mildew and they all defoliated uh, things like Madame Isaac Carrier and stuff like that. Um, and so I'd really, I'd sort of banished roses pretty much from the garden, apart from a few really healthy wall climbers. And then Josie and I both um, read about that if you have a, an allium with a with a rose, it keeps it black spot and mildew free. And again, because we're both science based, we thought, well, why is that? And of course, it's sulfur in the allium scent profile. And so then the other plant that has quite a lot of sulfur in it is are, are the um, salvia family. So that's that whole thing. That whole garden is an organic rose garden. And then we've also found that pelargoniums aren't quite as good, but they also have a bit of sulfur in them, different varieties. Um, and, and then it just seems, it sounds like I, I'm a witch, but basically it just seems like on a on a if if it's rained and then it's hot, coming up through the salvia is a very very dilute sulphur and it keeps those roses completely uh, mildew and black spot free without any fungicide. Um, so have you actually done trials to that yeah. effect? Yeah. Yes. And, yeah, well, and yeah, it, it's very difficult to reproduce exactly, isn't it? But you 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 still feel convinced. I mean, I remember you. I saw a picture of Munster Wood and I thought if there's any rose. Yeah. And it's black spot and disease pro it's months of wood. And David Austin stopped yeah. selling it now, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Because of that. But you find even that you can grow really healthily. It's not the healthiest, but another one is um Rhapsody in Blue, which 
you love or hate. I mean, it's that sort of purple denim colored one. Yes. Um, it's very, it's good for picking. So we'd always grown it, but we'd had to take it out because of black spot. Um, and uh, and so then we underplanted that with Nach Linda, which is one of the grey guys, as I'm sure you know, Salvis. Yeah, and Nightwatch. We've grown it ever, Nightwatch, exactly. We've grown it ever since. And and uh, it, the um, Rhapsody in Blue is healthy as anything. So, um, you know, you've got to get a relatively disease resistant variety on the whole and then marry it with a salvia and normally you're fine. But, you know, it doesn't always work. And Munstead Wood, you're absolutely right, is the least good. But Darcy Bustle, which is a similar colour, is a tiny bit better. And that's actually Darcy Bustle there, I think. But, but um, you know, things like Tuscany and Tuscany Superb, married with a salvia, are, are right as rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Darcy Bustle, yeah, I, I used to use a lot of Darcy Bustle. But again, David Austin has withdrawn that, which I think is a great shame. Mm. But they do actually propagate really well just from cuttings, don't they? And they grow very well, I think, even when they're not grafted. So um, yeah. Yeah. that will obviously yeah. be the way forward. So, no, I mean, they just look so full, those borders, don't they? So wonderful. But, but do you always sort of look with a very critical eye and think, well, next year I'm going to change that? Is that an ongoing edit you're doing the whole time? Yeah, and very much with Adam. So we're... we're uh as well as Josie. I mean, Adam and I might sit in the corner there having a drink in the evening in June. Yeah. And we have, we have just completely changed that garden as a result of that because it had become a bit sort of too high actually. Um, and so we've taken all the herbs out of the central beds and we've put more, one of Vita's design genius things, I think is the minaret um, uh, uh, needing your domes um, of the mosque needing minarets. And it had become too domey. We had too many domes of rosemary, too many domes of myrtle clipped, too many domes of roses, and we didn't have enough vertical. So we've actually taken almost all the herbs out of there. And um, and we've still got some roses, but we put more roses actually to echo in the middle. So yes, you're right. It's totally an evolution. And Josie, much more than me, is a brutal thrower outer or giver awayer. And yeah. so you know, plants are taken out the whole time here, whole time, yeah. And is Adam a, a knowledgeable gardener? Has he sort of, did he follow his grandmother's work and things, or? Um, he's he just he knows what looks beautiful. He's 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 got an incredibly genius eye. I mean, totally, totally fantastic eye, mm -hmm. and I would trust him more than anyone on aesthetics of of anything really. Uh, oh, that's really nice to have that, isn't it? Yeah. Have that, the, both of you working on it together, really. Yeah. Um, and um, the salvia there, is that Sarah Potosi on the left? Maybe uh, not. So, uh, that's Jezebel, the first. Jezebel. On the yeah, Jezebel and then Linda behind. And then um, the one called Stormy Pink, which I'm not sure is available right at the end. There's a, only a tiny glimpse of it, actually. Oh, um, right. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. They are brilliant, aren't they? The, the yeah. And you must be on a very heavy clay, are you or not? Very heavy clay. But mm. that plateau is pretty made up ground. I mean, that was just a cold frame. So, it, you know, that is a lot of builder's rubble underneath it. Um, mm. And we, we're on an organic 90 acre farm with with our own beef herd. So, you know, we've got copious quantities of of well, well rotted farm up in here. Um, and is that what you use to mulch the borders? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah but they're do. they're organic, so they're grass fed, are they? They're outside in the fields, <coughs> or are they inside? No, they, yeah, no, they come in from uh, November until <coughs> April. Although oh, we're actually, we're just changing our whole farm policy, and so and our you know we're actually going to get housing out in the fields and everything. So uh, at the moment they come in, but we're about to stop that. But we do have um, we do have about four years worth of. Winter's farmyard manure. Oh, yeah. wow. Um, I always found when you use that, the straw brought in bindweed and stuff, but you don't find that? No, we don't. What we do, we do get um, quite a lot of weed seeds. But yeah. what we find is as lot if we mix it with our own homemade compost and um, we actually have got, we seem to have got on top of it now. So we don't get, I mean, we do get Californian poppies and we do get some you know, bittercress and groundsel, but it's yeah. it, it's not too bad now. So even at Highgrove, where they were really 
you know, hot on making their own compost. They found it just produced more weeds. So mm. I think they, they are reverting to something else. Now they wanted a totally closed system because it is so difficult, isn't it? I'm, mm. I'm very anti-weed and I'll do anything to avoid mm. you know, putting on things that will, will introduce more weeds really. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, sure. um, and how much maintenance do you have over, over the garden? Not hmm. it's difficult for you to say, presumably, because some of them are propagating and doing other parts, perhaps. Yeah. But actually maintaining the garden, what would yeah, you? Say? We're, it, we're labour intensive here. I mean, there's just no two two ways about it. I mean, Josie, the head gardener, is now mainly on trials with me, um, and yes. you know, and sort of doing horticultural kind of research and checking because I write a book every winter, and so she then one, one book every winter. Yeah, but it's mad. I'm not going to do that again. But I have, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. And so, and we have basically two or perhaps three people out in the garden most days. Um, we may even in December, also. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gosh, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Two, wow. certainly. Yeah, two or three. Well, mm. certainly two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so wow. we mainly aren't seasonal. We're mainly full time people here now. Um, I did hear on one of your podcasts, I love listening to your podcasts, um, that you don't like it in the winter, though. You tend to go more to London in the winter. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Because uh, it just looks so idyllic. You think, how how could you want to go to London? Uh, well, of course, contrast is good, isn't it? Um, I just find uh, the thing that nurtures me here is well, I get up very, I get up at five in the morning or quarter past five in the morning and and I then have the garden to myself for three hours to just assess, kind of look at trials, see what's come up because we've got new things here. I mean, like some brand new things that are just off trial fields from around the world. And it, sometimes I might be the first person in Europe to look at something, you know, and yeah. I it's not that I don't mean power craze. I just find it really exciting that we because some of them obviously are hideous. And so you're like, but then sometimes you'll just come across something that's absolutely extraordinary. And it's, I find that very exciting. So I want to do that on my own. But of course, I don't have that between the middle of October and the middle of March, basically. And yes. so then, then I want quite a quiet time. And here is still quite busy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've got a lot of people coming in and out. And so then I, I feel like, you know, I just want to retire. You know, I, I want to have a more solitary time. Mm. So that's why I actually find London <laughs> relaxing, <laughs> very brilliant for solitary time. Yeah, I do. Uh, right. And have you got a garden in London? Yeah, I have. I bought a house right in South East London because it means I can nip for, in an hour and a quarter from here. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's in, in sort of Lewisham, exactly. Yeah. It's in St John's. It's in yeah. Mm. Um, and I, it's a very long garden. It's 120 foot down to the railway actually. Um, mm. And I quite like that because I quite like the feeling of being in a city or a town compared to here. Uh, and it's very long and thin, but it was designed very well by a, a, a garden designer who owned it before me. And I've actually kept it for now because yeah. I rather like, you know, she's got something that I would never plant. Like a, she's got a cornice and she's got a Japanese maple. And actually in a small uh, garden, I quite like that, you know, and there's masses of jasmine and tons of trachyspermum and, and so I haven't changed it. I am going to change it in time, but I haven't mm. changed it yet. Mm. So a real contrast between your very outward looking garden, yeah. that one, which is always lovely, isn't it? That sort of contrast. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. So when you said you were hunting down um, unusual plants, so what? just give me a couple that you found that I won't know that you think is an absolute must for a flower garden. So dahlias um, is, is the main one. And, and because I'm very keen on the pollinator uh, research at the moment, and, and the thing about dahlias is that they give pollen and nectar very late in the year, which is exactly when the pollinators are hungry, because um, yes. we, we've got, unfortunately, so many of our native wildflowers have gone. Um, so, for instance, there's a dahlia called Lou Farman that I work with a breeder in Holland, um, to develop and I, I just completely love it, but also it happens to be good for pollinators. It's got very tall, skinny stems, so it's very good for the vase. It looks great in a pot because it's quite elegant. It's got quite elegant foliage. So, you know, that's one example, or because of vase life, because dahlias historically have had very poor vase lives, like sweet peas, really. Mm. And so I've also been working with breeders um, in Holland to extend the vase life of some of the decorative and water lily varieties. 
And so we've got one that we've developed, um, which is called Molly Raven, named after our youngest oh, child. Yes. yes. And it has a buzz life of seven days, which for a dahlia is 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 pretty good. Um, you know, and like, that's with putting bleach or whatever in the water and yeah, you don't need to do that. Yeah. 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 I mean a bit, a bit of vinegar. A bit of bit vinegar. Of vinegar. Yeah. 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 Um okay. so those two, and then um, I mean I love uh, visiting breeders who've already bred like Narcissi. So I, I will be going next week to Holland where I'll visit a Narcissus breeder and then early tulip breeders and stuff. Mm. Um, so with them, I'm sort of more like they've already done an edit and then I'll be selecting from the edit. Because uh, as I'm sure you know from tulips, you know, getting from one single bulb to uh, oh 100,000 or whatever is, is 12 years. Whereas from a dahlia, so I, I went to Holland with Autumn in, in August and we selected six or seven dahlias. And those we can probably have, you know, out to the public um, within five or six years because you can divide the tuber and you can take cuttings, whereas with a bulb, you can't do that. So with, it's it's a long game. It's a long game. With a, with a lot of new plants you see coming on with plant be designs on it, they have obviously just micro propped them up, haven't they? Yes. But and then and then you have this massive advertising campaign, yes. and a lot of those you try them and they've had all this hype and they are so disappointing. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. But it does yeah. seem to be a, a a better way to try and grow them and just see how well they do and this grow them up slowly. Obviously, not so good for exactly. financially, I suppose. Exactly. But. No, but then here, you know, we just we would trial anything. You know, you know, we're about to move into breeding of a, a bit of, of some roses, but we would try them here for five years probably before we really felt that they were, um, they were sort yes. of worth, you know, launching because otherwise, you're not telling the truth, which is that you think this thing is is really superlative in in many ways. I mean, it's not just excellent; it's like the top of its field, and that's mm. what interests me is. If you're gonna, if we're gonna launch something, I've got to really, really believe in it in all ways. So it's got to be grown here for several years before it's launched, basically. Yeah, absolutely. But with roses, not... you, you, you'll they'll bring a new rose on, and it will have been clean for several years, and then suddenly it succumbs, isn't it? It's yeah. quite difficult to judge that. Yes. yes. Yeah. And but... that's true with tulips. Oddly, I mean, King Charles's favorite tulip apparently is um, this beautiful one called Brun Wimpel. Yeah, um, which is copper on the out uh, on the inside and and sort of silver on the outside, and um, that's got fusarium. The one breeder um, bought it, all the all the spare bulb stock in Holland, and his his um, field got fusarium, and the whole lot's gone. It's gone, and that's where with tulips, it's so you know it's so much harder. Whereas dahlias just they it's it's pretty apparent pretty quick if they're a good doer, mm. and you know, they, they might collapse but not in my experience I mean I'm still growing Rip City from Monet's garden that I bought 27 years ago it's the same plant yeah yeah um so then with with your box I know you had some box balls there so you you have you got any box moth or anything nasty box blight or is it we've all okay started, we've just started with a bit of box caterpillar no, uh, and at the moment we're just picking them off I mean it's very light but I think the fact that we've got it we probably will get it worse and they have got yeah. a sitting house which is not so very far away um right so um, so we, yes there's your box in, in that garden there but you can there is an organic treatment for box moth isn't yeah. it yeah so you yeah. you can use that which yeah. sort of, i'm just trying to remember the name um but it is just okay if you've got your spray pa1 and pa6 isn't it yeah, but, yeah. Um, but it's it's pretty safe um, and it's a, a nice one. Dipel, that's what it's called, Dipel. Okay. Um, no, so those are some more images that you just put up on the screen there. Um, so the the wild carrot and the, and the, is it a shepherd's hut in the garden there? It is, yeah. That's our spare <laughs> bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. I mean, one of them actually. It's not, we have got another, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so your that's... meadow to the left as well. Is that yellow rattle in there? In fact, that's um, Narcissus Hawera. Do you know that? Oh, very, right. That very yes, late, yes. Larry. Narcissus. Yeah. Yeah. There is a yellow rattle in there. Um, that, it, it, that is interesting in that the, the, the carrot has slightly choked the uh, ragged robin and things. 
you know, as 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 always happens in a way, um, it's very difficult to keep the balance right when you introduce something that's quite thuggish like wild carrot. So and I every love every year it changes, doesn't it? The dynamic, yeah. something else will yeah. take over next year. Yeah. Exactly. But I was amazed with your rich clay soil. Um, I mean, did you take all the soil off or anything before you started it? We it, yeah, it's again, it's pretty rubbish out there. So that was a building site for um for this the room that I'm in, in at the moment, not with us actually, it was built by the previous owners, but it was yes. down to it's it's made up ground. And we're we're on this very, very heavy clay, but we're also on um spring seams, and so there's terrible subsidence here. Um so like this building, we had to rebuild it with two meter deep or two and a half meter deep foundations, and we've still got cracks in the plaster two or three years on. So wow. every, everything's on the move here. So like We've got a whole field that just disappeared one night when we were in bed. <laughs> when you say it disappeared, it dropped, you mean? It just it just literally the whole, you know, the, the top um whatever, six inches of topsoil or whatever just fell down the hill. And in the morning there was a cliff and that was it. Wow. So what is the causing that then? Is it um <laughs> like faults? I know. Well, I think it is just we're on a hill, quite a steep hill, and it's very heavy clay, and there are loads of um, seeps, you know. So they're just uh, unbelievable. So the water, yeah. yeah, yeah. The spring water underneath is pulling it, sliding it down. Yeah, and there's a there's a farm just down the road where it, it's sort of rather glamorous in a way. It looks like these sort of crazy lamb forms, but it's not. It's not. It's not Kim Wilkie getting out his digger. It is literally nature just slipping it down under the grass so there the grass has held it so you haven't got cliffs like we did but it's all kind of crumpled and bizarre so <laughs> this whole part of the world and that's why i think traditionally this would all be wood and so I these see. are these clearings in the woods yeah and basically we're pretty much putting it back to that <laughs> yeah <laughs> so here's some of your lovely willow structures so this in a way adds a sort of structural bit doesn't it amongst yeah. your plants yeah. Um, and they're all from local hazel and willow and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So we've actually planted since we've lived here, we've actually planted really a, a huge amount of hazel so we can coppice it ourselves. <coughs> and um, we buy silver birch from uh, there's a, a, a three day event site about two miles away from us. And he supplies the, the brush for the three day event jumps. Oh, and nice. um, so he now supplies their man us at the same time. So we buy about 100 bundles of silver birch from him every year. And it's just harvested about 10, eight miles away. But we harvest a bit of our own and we harvest all our own hazel. And that our own willow is it, that broad bean cage is made from our own willow. Um, and on the on the top left. Yes, yeah, right. beautifully made. And how long will that willow last? Uh, two years. years. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then the silver birch is bottom right, is it? Are those <coughs> look exactly? Yeah. All the tea pieces are silver birch because they're pliable, whereas the hazel and the chestnut we also um, harvest here uh, from our own woods. But obviously, you can't weave it in the same way. So we actually find silver birch is the is the material we use most of of any because it doesn't root. Whereas willow, we have to be a bit careful that it can root yeah. very easily on us. Or um, so is. silver birches are sort of are um. Go to, go to really, yeah. And so you would those are coppiced as well, are they? So they just cut the young branches of the birch. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. they do it in the dormant season, so they last longer. Because exactly, exactly. And also, there's no leaf, so you don't have to yeah. strip the leaf. And the sap's rising, so you get this wonderful elasticity. So as yeah. soon as it comes into leaf, it, it, it loses that a bit, and it just becomes more brittle. And the next and the next um, shot shows the Chelsea hut that you did yeah. for the Chelsea recently. So there yeah. we are. And I just thought that was a lovely shot because it's the sort of thing even I might be able to make sort of. Yeah. And it, look, it looks so lovely because you've dressed it up and it's just a nice, simple design. Yeah. Um, and you've moved it back to your own garden, which is nice. Yeah, so it's, it's exactly. a bit more relaxing to use now than it was at Chelsea. No yeah. Doubt. Yeah, but that's to see who that is in there. I don't think that's me peering out. Anyway. Oh yes, there's someone peering out. Someone peering out. I don't know. And then I noticed you've got those lovely little chestnut hurdles, not homemade. Yeah. Or... Yes, you yeah. have made. Uh, well, some we one one of the guys here is brilliant at that sort of thing, but he's he tends to be quite busy now. So 
we we have a, a local guy who makes them or Colin who works on on the farm and does a lot of our sort of making of things um he mm. also can make them and they're a very good thing on a rainy day in January to to sit um and and make those but yeah. also I mean, I'm sure you know great dicksters sell all that kind of stuff now there's a guy that works on site there making them oh right that's useful to know and Dutch iris the next thing is um a next picture some pictures from Dutch iris and I, I, we've got them, in, well, we put them in the meadow here. And I think you did a talk at time, didn't you, last year? Yes, and yes. We, there's a lot in the meadow there. And they are, you said they're very much an unsung hero, which I quite agree with. They're fabulous yeah. plants, aren't they? And I don't know why people don't grow them more, really. They're so easy, inexpensive. Aren't they? Fabulous. Yeah, I, I think they're great. I mean, I really... Um... I'm I'm crazy about red embers. I think it's one of the most glamorous plants I know, actually. And it flowers just when you need things, when the tulips are gone, but before the roses come out. So it's that May gap thing. Yeah. yeah I'm crazy about it, but people just don't like them. But I don't know if you know that very chic hotel called Heckfield Place. Yes, 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 yes. Very much. Yeah. Uh, Sky Gingle. Sky Gingle, exactly. So I was well, so she cheered. was there. Yeah. Okay. I was so cheered. Um when I went there for a treat with my girls and um, and there all the mantelpieces were covered in Dutch iris. And I thought, well, come on guys, you know, if they've got them at Heckfield, really, you've got to, you've got to start growing them, but no one likes them. Really? <laughs> but yeah. I mean, at time, I, I rang up my, the bulb supplier I use and said, you know, will they hold their own in grass? And he said, they will just about hold their own. They won't diminish. Yeah. But um, and and a lot of people put them in borders, I suppose, don't they? But I yeah. just think that they're nice in a meadow too, really. Yeah. No, I and then I put the other shots in only because I know you've got wonderful containers, but they take quite a bit of work. But these two are more my line because they are so easy. Yeah. The oxalis. Yes. But I did wonder about the oxalis iron court. Does it seed true, or do you get masses of oxalis weeds, which are my number one hatred from okay. them? Okay. No. It, well, do you know, I don't think it really seeds at all, but it might be that we don't let it flower very much. I mean, we actually use that as a harvesting, a harvestable crop. So to that's eat. actually, yeah. yeah. Because mm. it's wood sorrel, as you know, so yeah. it's got that lovely lemon flavour. And the, and the flowers are really nice too. So we probably don't let it seed very much because we're just picking it so heavily yeah. <laughs> so i haven't trialed it but i must do that i'll put, i'll plop it in a in a bag of compost and see what happens that's how i tend to try whether something's comes true is i just literally put the plant and let it just scatter its seed into half a bag of comp compost oh, what happens yeah good idea and the original of course is very long flowering fabulous little plant in dry soil or a pot the oast house garden just looks so lovely so that's where adam writes up yeah, there. Exactly. yeah exactly uh, really idyllic and then some lovely collection of pots there and then more of your beautiful borders below um but um what sort of traditional methods of gardening do you really think are rubbish because you've obviously come at it with quite a new look and is there any anything particular that you think oh my god I would never do that now well I don't I think the thing of mixing um things in vases there's a load of rubbish talked about that and you know people tend to think oh wife sounds like you can't put dahlias for instance in a vase or you can't put narcissus for tulips I mean it's completely untrue it just happens to be that dahlias have a short vase life and so you'll be pulling them out before everything else has gone over I mean that's how I understand it I mean it's just simply not scientifically true that they do anything to the water oh um, I always thought that that, that uh, narcissus did you could yeah, they, they um they they just they bleed but as soon as they hit the water they stop bleeding so they seal so they it, it's just not it's just not true Oh, right. So you can mix any plant with any plant and it won't affect the life. Oh, that's a nice one. Euphorbia is the only thing you have to be careful of. And, and I would always say that in boiling water because it, it seals the stem end. So And that's only... just because of you touching it or getting it in your yeah. eyes, not because of what it does to the water. Well, no, obviously it'll make it cloudy in the water yeah, anyway. But, but... That, yeah, but that doesn't really matter. Oh, that's a good one. OK. And your the top tip that you've learned over the years that you think everyone should do? And we don't know about perhaps. Um, I mean, the salvia and the roses is a great one, isn't it? You, you give me a good I one. That, and I, I do really feel companion planting is, is the way to go with everything. So, I mean, the salvias, but also tajities in the greenhouse with basil. So, I mean, like we use 
all our tomatoes, chilies, aubergines are underplanted and cucumbers with tadgetes and basil, and we don't get any white fly. And whenever anyone comes in the garden, they or you know, and they walk through the greenhouse. They're like, why, why are your plants not covered in aphids? And it's like you must be spraying to to everything to death. And it's like we haven't used an insecticide here for fifteen years, so um, or longer. I mean, I never have. But I, um, the point is, companion planting is hugely, hugely, hugely effective. And tadgetes, particularly. I mean, I know with yeah. specific rose plant disease, uh, Dr. Winkelmann at I can't remember which university in Germany, I think it is, and she's discovered that the nematodes that they produce actually help the rose replant disease and that was just like a year and a half ago yeah. and she's done lots of scientific research on that and really? so that really made me think it has to be a specific tadgetes not just any yeah. old tadgetes yeah. but yeah. that certainly works for that so that was really interesting I thought yeah. that's yeah. fantastic Sarah thank you very much we must mention your book a lovely year full of veg uh, a fabulous book and thank you very much for your time. And um, I hope you have a great summer in the garden. I'm sure you will.